For two years, brother, for two years, I held my head high. I did everything for the charities. I did everything for the kids. And the reception I got when I came out here, you fans can stick it, brother. Because if it wasn't for Hulk Hogan, you people wouldn't be here. If it wasn't for Hulk Hogan, Eric Bischoff would be still selling meat from a truck in Minneapolis. And if it wasn't for Hulk Hogan, all these Johnny Come Latelys that you see out here, wrestling wouldn't be here. I was selling out the world, brother, while they were bumming gas to put in their car to get to high school. So the way it is now, brother, with Hulk Hogan and the new world organization of wrestling, brother, me and the new blood by my side, what you gonna do when the new world organization runs wild on you? What you gonna do? What are you hey, gonna don't do? Don't touch me, I'm gonna flee the lawyers. Welcome, everybody, to episode 34 of the Pseudo Nerd Podcast for August 26, 2016. I am your sober host, Josh Kaiser, and joining me today, uh, give me a hell yeah for Josh Haddix. Oh, hell yeah. And Hoagland316 says, I just ate your sandwich. <laughs> I'm not that mean. <laughs> That What's so, up? That was so random. <laughs> That's what I go for. That's what I go for. Oh, so, uh, how you guys doing this week? Dude, I, I completely forgot, well, kind of, that you were drunk last week when we recorded our podcast. How can you forget? Well, I mean, like, I didn't forget when he brought it up, obviously. I remembered. I just, I don't know. It's slipped my mind. All, all, that, all that feedback we got on social media. You know I was going to say, just everybody telling me to take it easy. You know, take a couple aspirin. Take my vitamins. Say Same my purpose. prayers. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's coming it up. Wasn't for your, it wasn't for your drunken assholeness. Like this podcast topic wouldn't exist. So that's I mean, that's so. true. Uh, this week's podcast, uh, we were going to do our list podcast, and even though we did a wrestling podcast last week, uh, we're going to do a list podcast based on a conversation that came up of most influential pay per views of all time. Uh, if you guys have not listened to episode 33, go back. You'll hear my opinion on that. Uh, and then again, you'll hear my opinion on today's podcast. This time uh, a couple octaves lower this week. Yeah, and a, and a f- better enunciation with my words. <laughs> uh, be- before we get into all that, though, we did talk about SummerSlam last week, uh, kind of previewing it, both uh, who we thought were going to win the matches and, and, you know, just the card in general. Uh what before we kind of go over our results? Uh, what was your guys' thoughts on the pay per view in general? Uh, very lackluster. I feel like it fo- followed the footsteps of WrestleMania compared to a few of the other ones that they've had. Like Battlegrounds was pretty good. <laughs> which which you would think like follow the footsteps of WrestleMania. Like oh that's that's great. Except WrestleMania yeah. sucked this year too. I feel like they're I feel like they're not delivering on their big four. Well, they're at least the last two of the big four, and and their smaller pay per views have been better. Yeah, I mean, well, Wrestle or Royal Rumble wasn't very good either this year. I think there was a, a singles match that might have been good, and I'm forgetting uh, what that is off the top. Was that was that a Rollins uh, triple threat or something like that? That may have been good, but the Rumble itself was wasn't very good at all. And to your point, WrestleMania and SummerSlam were both very disappointing. Yes, very. The problem I had with it is that it felt like. When you look at the card, it looked like a very, um, a very dynamic card. Like it, w- it wasn't the same names. It was people we probably w- really wanted to see shine and do well on a on a bigger stage, like a SummerSlam, which I think all of us agree is the second uh, biggest pay per view event of the year. So when you have when we you look at the card at face value, you think like this is actually going to be a pretty exciting one, and it just felt like the I think I felt like the matches that. Maybe people really didn't 
weren't meant to get a, a whole lot of, I guess, publicity. Didn't do too bad. Nothing crazy, but they did fine. And then the ones that I felt like needed to be the ones that brought it home uh, were absolutely anemic. They were awful matches. Well, or, they, and, or the match didn't happen at all, basically. Well, and that's that's part of it, too. So there are two finales, basically, or the last two matches of the night was Rusev Reigns, which didn't happen, and then the Randy Orton-Brock Lesnar main event, which ended in an awkward TKO situation and sort of like – like the last two matches had no – no winners. I mean, you know, Brock Lesnar won the match, but really it wasn't, wasn't a typical finish and it wasn't a very enjoyable finish. It's yeah. a finish that you would see on, like, <clears throat> on, a, on a non-important match on Raw or SmackDown. That is not the ending to your, your second biggest pay-per-view. That's, that was it. Yeah, was I think they, that, I think they wanted, to, they wanted to make Brock Lesnar look like even more of a monster than he already is. But it just came off like awkward and weird. Like it didn't look like that was what was supposed to happen, but not in a good way. Like, oh shit, I can't believe that happened. Like it was just very just bizarre. And then Shane coming out and taking an F5. Like it was just, it was just weird all around. It could have, it could have been done so much better. I, it's like Hoagie said, if you looked at the, the card beforehand, it was very exciting. Looked like some very good matches in there. Uh, and they just just bad writing. I, I feel like everything everything about the pay per view is bad. The best match was the was the Cena uh, AJ Styles match, and that was like in the middle of the pay per view. Yeah, it was. Like, I think it maybe in the second, the beginning of the second hour or something like yeah, that. But yeah, it, I, I no. will say it was a phenomenal match. Yeah. No pun intended. And it was for nothing. It, it was for nothing. No no championships or anything. And it was the best match on the card. That, yeah, that and, should have ended the pay per view. Yeah, well, how do you have a match that's no no championships, nothing in a pay per view? Yeah, I mean, well, well I mean, that, and not just, be the Brock Lesnar Orton headliner. But on top, bad writing. On top of that, you had your two world championships just get buried in the middle of nothing. So they they both lost importance to me. It was like, you know, Ziggler Ambrose happened, and then a little bit later Rollins and Balor happened, and oh by the way, like there's a woman's match like six man tag after that like it was just yeah. the way the card the was laid out was bad. stupid it was just they were so lost in the shuffle of everything else that it just it was just if they weren't that important and i do they've been doing that lately where if they have like what they would consider like a triple main event and now they're going to do that more often now that they have split brands so you're going to have your main event if they're well, going to be they're going to be separate pay-per-views now well, right, I'm right. About the, just the major they're pay-per-views split, they're not split royal rumble SummerSlam, wrestlemania well, Survivor yeah, yeah. Series. they're gonna have all of them for that one so for that they're, they're gonna have at least two main events and in some cases you're gonna have three you're gonna have two, you're gonna have each of the world title matches and then you'll have like a maybe like a raw versus smackdown headlining one like a lesnar orton match and because of that you don't do all three of them at the same time because for whatever reason they think that the the if the if the crowd is going to get into it they're going to get fatigued by having three matches but once again the matches weren't that great to begin with right uh i mean i'm not saying that ziggler and and dean ambrose didn't have a good match or 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 balor and rollins didn't have a good match it's just that was such a long time ago it felt like that it was just hard to remember the match after you see two straight matches of shit and they weren't memorable enough to really remember i mean they were fine but they're not you know cena style sticks out my mind but the, the rest of them don't you know what, and I'm not saying you always have to, you don't always have to do what, you know, people think should happen or whatever, but that Ambrose Ziggler match, there was like 99% of me knew Ambrose was going to win that match. Like, who really thought Ziggler was going to win that match? So no matter how good it is, when Ambrose wins, you're like, okay, yeah, that's what I figured was going to happen. Like, both of those matches had a, a huge disadvantage to both of them, which was, for the most part, predictability or disinterest. So Dean Ambrose and Ziggler, as much as I like Ziggler, I think 98% of the fans out there knew that Ambrose was going to walk out with the title. Exactly. So there yeah, wasn't right. a whole lot of interest. Then you go to the Balor-Rollins match. There were more people focused on hating the new belt than the, than the actual match. So then you have people you know, chanting you know, things about the Yeah, belt. the crowd was really annoying in that match too. They were just trying to put themselves over, and you know. even Rollins. Uh, I believe Rollins went on Twitter to he did. to kind of to go off on them about like, come on, guys, like we're we're you know we're busting our asses out there, and the only thing you can think about is that the the belt is red. 
More like Rollins is busting other people's asses, right? Right? Right, guys? Right. He's like, he's like, he's like, he's like the new age Goldberg. Ruining people's careers. All right. And that, that's not a compliment. Not yeah, a compliment. No, no, it's not. Uh, so real quick before we get into our po- uh, topic for the day, Haddix, why don't you go ahead and give us the results of our uh, predictions last week? So what they, what they push on the Reigns Rusev matchup because it never happened. Uh, although we all picked Reigns to win, but whatever. Uh, and a very controversial push. On the New Day versus Club tag team title matchup, me and Hoagie tied at five and three. Kaiser bringing the caboose at three and five. Uh, I blame alcohol on that. <laughs> How do you blame alcohol? Because I was drunk when I made those predictions. Oh, yeah, that's right. For some Come reason, on. why did I think that we did our predictions two weeks ago? Which ones did I, wait, wait, which ones did, did any I of you guys? Was, I was drunk last week and none of you guys remember the podcast. <laughs> this is about, so this is so right. running, running through it very quickly. We all, we all picked Seamus to win. Uh, Hogan and I picked the Miz. Kaiser picked Cruz, which Idiot. he was wrong. We all picked Sasha Banks to lose, which we were all very wrong on, which kind of shitty to come You mean we out. picked Sasha Banks to win and she lost? Yeah, yeah, she lost. It, apparently I, Heard that she like was take, getting time off after this paper. Well, she was season. she was hurt. She got hurt during the NXT uh, match she had the night before. Uh, uh, Wasn't she also recently married? Yes, she was. Yeah. So we all picked Sasha Banks and she lost. So we all lost that one. Kaiser and I picked Enzo and Cass. Hoagie picked Y two J K O. So he won that. Uh, Kaiser and I picked Styles. Hoagie picked Cena. So me and Kaiser won that. We all picked the club. I'm sorry. I picked new. I picked club. Kaiser picked club. Hoagie picked new day. Again, controversial. But we all picked Ambrose. We all picked uh, team Becky Lynch. All, all the girls that run her team. We all lost that. Which, if I had known that Nikki Bella was coming back, yes. that, uh, that, that would have made different. I'm really curious of who the third person would have yes. been. If I if I had known more about it or what what the possibility could have been, if the possibility could have been Nikki Bella, I would have sided with Nikki Bella. Yeah, as would right. I. But at no the time, no, nope. right yeah, at the time. Uh, and then Hoagie and I picked Finn Balor. Kaiser picked Rollins. We all picked Reigns. Uh, Hoagie and I picked Lesnar. Kaiser picked Orton. So, so the, if, the ones that you got wrong, Kaiser, weren't necessarily bad. Like I mean, I mean to be fair, Seth Rollins could be the Universal Champion uh, in, in in an upcoming uh, couple of weeks here. So. And, and, I think Orton was your biggest stretch in a sense that he yeah right. Lesnar thing, but I mean it's not like it's that crazy. Anyway. Well, I think you. I think he also picked Orton on the the fact that I think as as drunk as he was, I think he also knew that if he was going to try and beat us, he had to pick different on the last match, anyways. To if he was going to like if it was going to come close, like a tiebreaker type of thing, he wanted to pick something different than you and me. Yeah. That's what I thought. I thought that was the reason why you picked Orton. You're giving me, you're giving drunken uh, me way too much credit. Too much credit, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> but anyway, uh, but so that's the results. Uh, you know, it is what it is. We're to, we'll uh, we'll continue giving bad predictions as we always do. Yes. It's no different in wrestling as it is in baseball or basketball or anything else. Um, so moving on, we're gonna we're gonna go through. Um, normally we do a list, and this week uh, we were doing a list of most influential pay-per-views. And we actually came across the Bleacher Report article, um, which gives their 10 pay-per-view events that changed pro wrestling history. So so very much on the same topic that we were discussing earlier. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go through this list, and I'm going to give you guys a... Uh, I'm going to, you know, kind of read it off and we'll discuss, debate, whether we think things should be on here, shouldn't be on here. And after we get through the top 10 list list a couple that we had personally that were not on this list and then we'll close it off with a quick uh, top three for each of us of, of importance um, that said the first pay-per-view listed in their uh, list here is actually one not from WCW or WWE it is in fact ECW's barely legal 1997 uh, I believe it was the first pay-per-view uh, ECW uh, did, which uh, to their credit, you know, there was a third federation out there, you know, big enough to do something like that. 
I don't know how you guys feel about putting it didn't on this it, list. Didn't it come out later that uh, Vince was like funding ECW, or was that later? Yeah, on? there was. I mean, it came out. I don't know at the time how known it was, but it was definitely came out later that Vince was doing a lot of the the funding for ECW was as he? well as like kind of grooming. It was almost like his his independence, like an NXT sort of thing, where he had uh, people that they were basically taking away once they were big enough or, or useful enough to well, Vince. He, I think we gave him like a direct access to the talent if he wanted to like offer contracts and stuff. Was too. he funding from the beginning or was it something like ECW started and then – No, just- I think it was later on. They were they were in some money trouble and I think uh, Vince Vince on. had his connections with uh, Heyman and stuff like that. So yeah. I think he, he just kind of – he knew he knew opportunity. The, the man the man knows business and, and – you know, he did what he had to do. And then that's when he started seeing a lot of those, the big names from ECW eventually making their way into WWE was, you know, much in credit to that. So I don't know. Uh, I can't speak much on this pay-per-view. I didn't, I only watched here and there ECW. Uh, but I think it's notable, if nothing else, that it was a third brand yep. with a major pay-per-view. And it did become very popular. I mean, it, it was a very well-known third brand for a while but i was 11 bef- so it was before i really started watching pay- or wrestling and uh i wasn't big into ecw so i can't speak much on it either i mean i watched it later um i think uh one of our friends came over with the the i don't, I, don't, I remember i don't know if it was beyond the mat or it was like the rise and fall of ecw i think it was the rise and fall of ecw and they had this pay-per-view and I, they had to go through a lot of trouble and like, you know, turmoil to get the cable companies to come on board to do it and end up being a very big success. But I think a lot of people, the reason why I think this is on the list and there's a reason why it's actually on, on, um, it was on my focal point for like a top list might not be top three. I'll think about that as we go along, but you definitely started seeing a lot of the silence, the silence, God, I can't talk the sex, the violence, the, 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 a lot of the stuff that the Attitude Era would later adopt, and it's hard. I, I totally can see the argument that this pay per view may have um, opened up the eyes of the creative juices in WWE to also take on more of a, an edgy uh, outtake on their content. I could see that. I could. I could definitely uh, get on board yeah, with that. I mean, there was definitely at least the hardcore aspect of it. Uh, if nothing else, that was def- that was something. Well, you gotta remember, that- like the Sandman was guzzling Stevie Weiser's years before Steve I mean, Austin where, was ever doing stuff cac- like that. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So, not saying they're stealing from them, but I mean, Heyman will tell you that he thinks that WWE took a lot of liberties. Heyman um, will tell you a lot of things. You, you got to take some things that Heyman says uh, with a grain of salt. Well, I mean, if you're, if you're gonna talk about anything that's his baby, I mean, he's gonna defend that to his dying breath. Yeah, but Heyman's also he's he Heyman is as much a promoter as they come and will will say some things and stretch the truth and, and things like that. I'm not saying that this isn't the case in the, in that particular um moment, but there's definitely things that Heyman says that it's like you know, it's Heyman. You just got to understand that the guy uh the guy's good at what he does, but he also there's a reason a lot of those guys weren't getting paid. And, you know, we're staying with him is because he was like, come on, we'll take care of you. I'll take care of you. And, you know, they owed him, you know, three months worth of paychecks. So, uh, he's, he has this slimy side, but I love the dude. <laughs> uh, moving on though, the next one on the list, uh, Halloween Havoc 98, uh, the WCW pay per view. This one for me, I don't, really agree that it should be on a list they put it on here because they they sort of refer to this as when wcw started hitting their downfall uh because they pretty much botched the uh the ending they ran out of time uh so they couldn't uh they couldn't show the championship matchup main event so then they showed it for free the next night on nitro uh and it sort of it sort of killed them at that point and I think that's why they put it on the list. But I personally, uh, it's definitely influential from don't. a business standpoint. I yeah. get why it's on the list. 
it was one of those things where, yeah, ever since I think the WrestleMania of that year, I believe WWE just, you know, took the lead, but not by much, but they were, you know, slow, they were consistently, you know, edging out, uh, WCW every week in the ratings with a couple of differences like Goldberg being Hogan and which is a, a huge mistake, but I mean, yeah, it helped for ratings uh, on Nitro. But this, but this particular pay per view was a big turning point in '98 when it was, you know, '98 was the year where it was like make or break for either company to really, uh, you know, come out on top. And this was the probably the first uh, card where we saw one of the one of the companies really shoot themselves in the foot, especially because Goldberg not being a great worker probably had one of the best matches of his career with a, with like a 45 year old diamond Dallas page. And it was a great match and it was a match that everyone paid for and then ended up, you know, being screwed out of because the satellite feed ran out. So instead you're, you're, you're forced to have to watch Hogan and warrior have probably one of the worst matches of all time with a terrible finish. Uh, with they botched a fireball thing in the face, which I've always hated those things, anyways. Um, there's just too many. There's too many possibilities of that screwing up. Yeah, it's cheesy, anyways. It was a. It was a very. It it. If anything, it's influential for all the wrong reasons, and there's nothing good to come out of this pay per view, other than uh, Rathmeet uh, pinned Meng. So you know that's something, right? If I remember correctly, that was actually a big storyline because both of them were like undefeated for like months and like they were squashing everybody. So that that was actually a slightly interesting match. It was like the card itself really wasn't bad. Minus like a, I guess there was like a, I guess a U.S. championship match. Bret Hart beat Sting by knocking him out or something. Like I don't remember. I can't remember the, the true ending, but I know no, there was no pin or submission. But if you look at the actual the card, the card is actually really good. Um. It has potential. Yeah, for sure. It just it it was killed by the latter half of the card, or really the last two matches of the card. So we won't spend any more time on it. Uh, let's move on. The next one on the list they have is Money in the Bank 2011. Uh, I'm going to be honest. I have no recollection. This was a time of wrestling I never watched. I wouldn't even have thought twice about this one. Uh... I don't. I don't know. I can't really comment on this one and why it's on here. Yeah, I can. I can pretty easily. Um, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. It's it's big because it was it was kind of like a a very big passing of the torch type of ma- type of uh, pay per view where the the actions that happened at Money in the Bank really opened up what would happen all the way up till WrestleMania. It was definitely the big you know CM Punk winning the title and then holding it for over a year. You know after that. You know, he didn't, he had that title for almost like, I think it was like what, 450 days or just a little bit under that. And it was the longest reign in history and it started at, uh, that pay per view, which was in Chicago against Cena. It was probably one of the most bipartisan crowds you'll ever hear in your life, uh, because it was CM Punk in Chicago and everybody hates Cena. So that made that into a really awesome match. And then to put on top of that, Daniel Bryan, um, was also another guy who he won the money in the bank contract at money in the bank goes on to beat the big show and ends up being probably one of the bigger heels of the company all the way up until he lost that lost the match or lost his title to Sheamus. I think in like what nine seconds at WrestleMania, but it's a big match because it, it was a big change in the landscape of who we had to expect being like the number one guys. Cause it ended up being punk and Daniel Bryan. Yeah, I guess if they're, I think they were just trying to find their way to make a ten things on the list and put this one on there. But I'm gonna be honest, <laughs> I would never have thought twice about this, I, nor thought that this is what catapulted either of their yeah. careers. I think there's, and and when we get into our R three or whatever that didn't make it, I think there's some that really changed the path of wrestling more than this one in particular that that aren't on this list but we can get into that when we do our our honorable mentions or whatever uh yeah and moving on this is another one that to me is similar to the last one uh for for different reasons starcade 97 um this was uh you had the uh 
Sting and Hogan matchup, which is probably the the big one that WCW was was pushing. It's right up there with you know like a Hogan Flair kind of thing. Uh, apparently, it was the best pay per view that WCW ever did, according to this report. So I can understand it from from that aspect. It was it was their best buy rate. Uh, still, uh, you know, they, they kind of botched the ending in many ways. I think people expected it to be Sting going over Hogan, but let's be honest, nobody ever goes over Hogan. (laughs) And, uh, especially when he has creative control, right? That's right. So I don't, I don't know. Again, not one, probably a solid pay-per-view, uh, with some good buildup, but just nothing, Nothing that strikes me as influential in the annals of wrestling pay-per-view history. Nothing had ex- – like, the only thing I was going to say was it's it's on – I said I, I understand once again why it's on the list. It's – this was probably one of the most promoted pay-per-views in a while. That's why it has such a huge buy rate because this was when Sting was – was becoming the, you know, the crow kind of character. He didn't wrestle for months. You know, we didn't know, no one knew what his alliance w- w- stood at, whether if he was in the NWO, if he was in WC, if he was supporting WCW. And he was basically just stalking Hogan for months and months and months until he finally agreed to a match, which was for the title. So there was just so much. The booking for this was actually really good. The promoting of this was good. I mean, I mean, once again, a 1.9 pay per view buy rate, which is insane. Um, they, I, I was just reading this, like they're comparing this as like, this was basically WCW's Hogan versus Andre the giant because of the promoting of this and just the, you know, how much this was been building up, uh, until it was now, once again, the, the, uh, the issue with it was Hogan versus Andre ended in the way that it, I think it was meant to end. Whereas once you, like you said, Sting versus Hogan, uh, had some pretty, had, was a pretty bad, ending it ended with sting winning but it should have been sting winning outright well and that and as the article goes on to say and is and this is just typical wcw the the referee at the time was supposed to be uh was nick patrick he's supposed to be biased towards hogan and do a quick count to sting uh giving hogan the win then bret hart would come out as a special enforcer to restart the match and remove uh nick patrick and if and bret hart would officiate the finish and all that would have sounded good. Yeah, it would have been fine. But Nick Patrick instead counted at regular speed, <laughs> and Hogan pinned Nick Sting. Hogan actually won legitimately. Won legitimately. So then, what does WCW do after they're like, "Ah, oh, shit, he, he screwed that up." Ah, oh, quick, send Hart out anyways, and continue as though like Nick Patrick screwed him over. So it becomes like very confusing. Like, well, why did they take it out? And it's almost like Brett and Sting just cheated. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Then then it turns that way. And that's just so typical WCW, like just botching things left and right. Well, it's the a- problem, too, about that was that you would think that after that match, you would think that this would be like the turning point where WCW is now on top again. They, their main guy is now the champion. When in all honesty, NWO was still the dominating force for many, many months and years after that. So it, it was it was like there was no real payoff for that match because it was just business as usual the, the very next day where NWO is antagonizing everybody and Hogan is trying to get his title back. So it's there really wasn't like a like a great conclusion to this that that favored the good guys anyways. Yeah, exactly. So uh, we'll we'll kind of move on from this one, and we got a lot to get through. And these couple ones aren't going to be the ones I want to spend time discussing. Neither is the next one, which is WrestleMania 21. Uh, I guess this is where they they said that you know this is where this is sort of the equivalent of that Money in the Bank, where this was when John Cena and Batista and Edge would become like mainstream people going forward so i think this is another one they wanted a top 10 list and they picked ones like oh let's pick ones that involve the sort of the the beginning of the rise of major players and in, in, in wwe and i can understand it from that aspect other than that uh big show fought in a sumo match i mean what that's just all i need to say about this Honestly, card. i feel like this is like you said i feel like this is just this happens like it, at some point, you have to pass this pass pass the torch to like the next era of superstars. So like, it doesn't it doesn't change 
pro wrestling history. It's just something that has to happen, you know, every X amount of years, you know what I mean? Because you have to keep that talent rotating. That doesn't, just because that happens at a pay-per-view doesn't mean that it's, you know, one of the most influential things ever. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's just what happens. You know what I mean? When was, when was the first Money in the Bank ladder match? I feel like this is one of the first ones, especially because Edge won it. Uh, I thought that was another pay-per-view that, it may have been – that may have been the first one. If not the first, it had to be – so so we're looking at we're looking at the card. Let's say this was the first. So if this was the first Money in the Bank match, that's already, you know, kind of influential because now there's there's a pay-per-view just that, that's revolved around it. Um, you've got Cena and um, – I'm sorry, Batista winning their matches and winning the titles. And honestly, my one of my favorite matches, probably like top three of all time – Kurt Angle and Shawn Michaels, which was a fantastic match. So as far as the content minus Akibono, big show, uh, this was actually a really good card overall. And yeah, it, it has a lot of the 2011 money in the bank, uh, where it's, you know, you're, you're, you're now kind of, but this is when you do it. You do it at WrestleMania where you're like, okay, these are the guys that are going forward. Not so much money in the bank. It's kind of a weird time to do it. Um, but no, I can, once again, I can see why it's on the list. Uh yeah, and I just was looking that up about Money in the Bank. It was the first one at WrestleMania 21. So, so uh, yeah, so then that's another notch on 21 as well. Again, uh, fair to put it on a top 10 list, I guess, but it's not to me, you know, the most influential. It's not one that I'm going to sit here and be like, I remember back at uh, WrestleMania 21, that was really the yeah, day exactly. that John yeah. Cena, I mean, there's, there's Edge, and Batista. between influential and memorable. I mean, like, we're, I know, I, I have a feeling no, the ones you're going to pick are to be the ones that are going to be like the classic ones that are going to be remembered. No, it's but. not even, it's not memorable. I'm not saying that this pay per view wasn't memorable. I'm saying like influential. The fact that Edge, not- it, it, Edge Batista and, and John Cena were going to be big stars regardless of what happened at WrestleMania 21. Like that was not think, like those that moment put all of them over. It's, I think the it, I think the, the best example is going to be the next pay per view and how, the difference between WrestleMania 21 and the next pay per view is the difference between memorable and influential. Right, and it, uh, I would even argue that one that's not on here at all, not on our list. The Hell in the Cell match with Taker, at, with King of the Ring, whatever year it was, where uh, Taker and Mankind had their wrestling match. That, to me, might be one of the few times a match single-handedly catapults a person uh, into stardom. I mean, Mankind was always, like, there and always a solid worker. If it was not for that match, I don't think he's ever gets to the point that he was at. Where oh, yeah. I don't think that's the case with any of those, with, with Cena, Batista, Edge, at WrestleMania 21. That's that's my argument there. Um, but okay, we'll move on to what they have as number five on their uh, list. This, as you heard last week, uh, for me is the most influential of all time, and that's Bash at the Beach '96. And this is when H- Hogan turns heel, joins the NWO. He is the third man. Uh, really changes the landscape of WCW. And not only changes the landscape, but really this is this is when they uh you know, the New World Order and WCW take over the ratings war and they have eighty three weeks of ratings dominance over WWF, which is it's just a, a an amazing stat. And that heel turn for Hogan really to me was the catalyst in, in all of it. Yeah, Hoagie yeah, could I, probably – sorry, you could probably elaborate more, Hoagie, because you guys were big into WCW. I really wasn't. But from a WWF fan at the time, uh, I mean, it basically was Hogan and NWL. So I would assume this was a huge pay-per-view. This was one of those things where – another thing that changed was I think the idea of, like, kooky characters and, like – you know, su- you know, heroes and villains. I think this kind of threw that out the window, which is another reason why this was a really influential pay per view because they were already starting to do that. They were kind of making that transition at this point, but Hogan was always still the red and yellow, you know, larger than life superhero type of character. And he, when he decided to, you know, turn heel, 
it was just almost like the rules of wrestling kind of went out the door about who's good, who's bad, you know, who like the, now you can have, uh, you know, good guys that are assholes. And then you've got, you know, your, I, I guess you would say your bad guy, the, the, you know, your villains that people actually want to cheer for. So I think that was also the big thing about Hogan, uh, kind of going over to the dark side was that you kind of had a gray area now with characters where people didn't need to be, you know, either a really good guy or a really bad guy. You can kind of start, if you want to be yourself and let your actual, let your, let yourself be your own character. Uh, I think that really started catapulting around this time too. Yeah. I mean, that in this, it was probably within the, you know, sort of when Hall Nash came over, they started doing that, uh, thing. And then this, this just further, uh, pushed in that direction. Uh, I again think that if Hogan doesn't join the NWO, if there was rumors of, uh, originally the third man was supposed to be Sting, that may have been interesting. But if the third man ended up being the Giant or you know I don't you know insert somebody else at that point, even maybe Flair at the time, like I don't think the NWO ever gets to where it is because having Hogan who was who was and still to this day is one of the most recognized people in all of sports entertainment at the time was above and beyond the most recognized guy. He was in movies. He was the hero. He was, you know, people think he, John he was professional wrestling. Yeah. And people think John Cena is, is, is a good guy now. And, you know, John Cena turning heel. If, if John Cena turned heel tomorrow, it would still not come close to the level that it was when Hulk Hogan turned on everybody, uh, turned his back on WCW. Uh, that <laughs> that is I, that will never be duplicated. I mean that's just how it is. And that's why I think this is the, the most influential in, in my opinion. And it was also one of the biggest promos or whatever you want to call it, Mean Gene Okerlund moments. Like that that whole thing after the match was also truly iconic. Just having listening to Hogan for the first time acting like just, a heel and he, he killed it. Yeah, he, he just it. He bashed the fans at Bash at the Beach. Oh, I see what you did there. Yeah. Uh, now moving on uh, to number four on their list. This is this is another big one. Uh, this could be WWF's version of Bash at the Beach in some ways, uh, and that's WrestleMania 14. This is in all for all intents and purposes. This is when Stone Cold Steve Austin became the guy uh, for WWF. And led them. It, it, for many people, this is the beginning of the Attitude Era, and you guys can. I'll let you guys talk a little bit more on this one and why it was important. I'll let Haddix go since he can actually talk about this. Yeah, seriously. Um, yeah, whether, and I think we talked about this on a previous podcast. Like, there's all these um, different times when the Attitude Era started or whatever. But Austin becoming the number one guy. And he's arguably the the biggest wrestling, I guess, superstar ever. If it comes uh, to it's coming down to money and ratings, it is. Yeah, well, he yeah, is. definitely to money. I mean, maybe even just household name. What, like, I think if you asked, you know, a hundred people a, a wrestler, everyone knows Stone Cold Steve Austin. I mean, he's just he was he was larger than life. And if this was the start of that him becoming the champion i mean it's it's huge it's gigantic it's what eventually put wcw out of business i don't know about ecw that might have already been out of business but it, it's what catapulted the wwe to what it is today which is the only business that's still alive this well, was this, this was the second golden age of wrestling as far as i'm concerned uh you had your 80s boom and then uh after after like kind of like the early days you know probably like the latter days of uh of onto the giant and then obviously Hogan, you know, being the main eventer and ultimate warrior. Then you kind of had this long lull of just the same shit over and over for the most part. Uh, and then you, then I think around 97, 98, you, you kind of start ending into like that second golden age. And then this was definitely to me, uh, the, the, like the really the true golden age where it was both companies, both WCW and WWE both being at even, even footing. And then I, I and I think that's the reason why WrestleMania 21 people give credit saying that that could have possibly been the third golden age of wrestling because it was the passing of the torch again to the new guys. 
And then, you know, the people who, who are still to this day, other than maybe like Batista and obviously Edge is retired. But a lot of those people who were on that card and people who were, that they were trying to give pushes to or, you know, were the people that were sticking around and, and holding on to it to the, this day. Um, well, the thing I loved about this was that this began, uh, thanks to Tyson, thanks to McMahon, this started the greatest rivalry feud of all time, which is Austin McMahon. Uh, I mean, I don't know. LOD won a tag team battle royal there. There's probably some good, uh, <laughs> some good feuds going on in that match too. But no, I agree. That's, uh, that's, yeah, probably the biggest feud of all time because it went on for so long. Um, well, it's also the what, feud, it, it was also the feud when WWE was making the, easily the most money. And you, yeah. you gotta give McMahon credit to that. I mean, he, he helped make that happen. And for, and for as long as the feud lasted between two guys, McMahon and, and Austin, it was like fresh though. It, it was, they, they put yeah. spins on it. They would make, absolutely, they would almost make you think like McMahon likes Stone Cold for a hot minute and then he turns his back on him again. Like it was, it was great writing to keep that, you know, to keep that going. To, yeah, to not, to not great. ever get bored or stale or yeah. something. Um, we got a few minutes left of, before we gotta, uh, get through our, to get through this list anyways. So we're gonna move on. And the next one on the list is actually the beginning of this McMahon character. Uh, Survivor Series 97, the Montreal screw job, one of the most famous moments in all of pay-per-view history. Of course, this is when Bret Hart was uh dropping the was supposed to drop the title to Michaels then he was going to do it the next day they went back and forth there's a whole inside thing where McMahon had the ref call the bell Michaels wins the title putting Bret Hart in his own finisher it's a real big dick move on everybody's part Bret Hart <laughs> spits in Vince's face uh signs that he's going to WCW and that's and then just, it then just beats the shit out of the equipment yeah it was a, it was a very uh didn't it it didn't was a very McMahon? real moment. He punched yeah. him backstage. Behind yeah, him. backstage. Yeah, yeah. So it was. Uh, it was as far as wrestling goes. They broke a lot of, uh, kind of a lot of no, you know, like unwritten rules, that kind of thing. Uh, and this, you know, Vince McMahon, to his credit, embraced the uh, the hatred, embraced the, you know being the bad guy, and and that became the McMahon character. Which to you know what you guys were saying with Austin, like if if. Survivor Series 97 doesn't happen the way it does. Maybe there's no McMahon character and maybe yeah, there's yeah. no McMahon Austin. So dude, t- tip your hat to how business savvy Vince McMahon is. That dude I feel like you say around. tip of the hat or the cap every podcast. Dude, the guy likes to tip his cap. I wanted to call this the tip of the hat podcast, but you guys didn't like it. No, you, I, wa- I, I, you wanted to call it just the tip podcast and we said yeah. no. So <laughs> the hat came later. Uh, <laughs> But the, uh, this one was – this was actually I think the first pay-per-view that I watched when getting back into wrestling uh, was Survivor Series 97. Um, and I'm glad I did even though I was really confused because, you know, you're – what was I, 12? And I'm just like, what, what's going on? I, I thought it was – I thought it was – I think a lot, a lot of people thought for a little bit, if you're younger, I thought it was a – it was an act. Yeah, I mean, even if that happened today, you would think that was part of the storyline. You wouldn't be sure. So for them to blend it back then where the realism still was not not prevalent, you know, you know, as you were talking about uh, the Hall Nash kind of characters, this was still this was still on the edge. Even WWF at the time was still kind of back and forth with having the goofy characters and, and the real characters. So this was this was right on the, you know, right on the edge of it. This was also the, like a pair of you that re- I think you know WWE really made a decision where you know forever it was you know two huge ego guys Hart and uh, Shawn Michaels and I, I I do feel like there's a, a, a part of this that uh, McMahon didn't try matching Bret Hart's offer one I don't think he could have I mean he doesn't have Ted Turner money but second of all I think it just would have fixed a lot of things in the locker room to get rid of somebody like that because it was it, during that time, it was a very poisonous um, locker room with both of them being in it at the same time. So I, I think this also uh, was kind of like a two birds, one stone type of thing to just burn that bridge and just, you know, cut ties with Bret Hart. And it, it definitely worked out because W or WCW had no idea what to do with Bret Hart when he, when they signed him. <laughs> 
story of WCW's life, not knowing how to handle talent when they come over. <laughs> uh, they know how to sign them, and then that, after that, it's kind of up in the air. Uh, moving along, we've got number two on their list, WrestleMania three. Of course, this is uh, known as uh, one Hulk Hogan body slammed Andre the Giant, brother. Oh, and, uh, <laughs> you know, this... The Superdome or the Silverdome? <laughs> in the Pontiac Silverdome. It's the Silverdome. Uh, this, you know, back in the early days of pay-per-views, you know, you had your, uh, you know, your original Star Cage, your original WrestleManias. They were supposed to be these, these bigger-than-life uh, cards full of matches. Quote-unquote super cards, I think is what they were calling them. Uh yeah, super cards. Uh, this was this is if they needed a blueprint to go forward back in the day of how to do a super card, this was it. Uh, the Hogan Andre match was hyped and it lived up to the hype, even though like by today's standards it would have been garbage. Uh, Steamboat and Savage fought for the Intercontinental Title in probably still arguably one of the greatest uh, matches of all time. And plenty of other, you know, top to bottom. This was, this was the the vision Vince had when he created WrestleMania One. They had ninety three thousand people uh, watch this in person, which is still, I think, top three or four for their uh, for the WrestleMania attendance. So just this this card uh, is just always iconic for for the Hogan match, and then it's just always it's just one of the the best pay per views they've probably put on from the from that era. Oh yeah, I think that's why it's on the list. Uh, basically, everything you said it 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 just all all around was a great pay per view. I don't think any like the ones we just talked about. I don't think it was like the rise of any character or anything like that. I mean, Hogan was already the shit before that anyway. So, it, but it was just a great pay per view all in all. It was a dream match because it was two two guys that were always been known as being big faces in the company. And everything that they've done. I mean, these are probably one of the two most beloved, uh, characters. And Andre the Giant, uh, you know, seeing dollar signs, I think, I think it was just more Andre the Giant's idea than anything was put me in the main event with Hogan. I'll go heel and we'll promote the shit out of WrestleMania three. And it, back then, I mean, there, there was, there were no two people that would have created, that brought 93,000 people than Hogan. And Andre the Giant, it would have made no sense whatsoever to put anybody else at the top of the card. Oh, oh and also, um, uh, congratulations to Butch Reed, who defeated Coco Beware, who is a Hall of Famer. Uh, I was going to say, that may have been the match that sold 93,000 tickets. I don't know, you're talking about this Hogan, uh, Andre the Giant, but Butch Reed and Coco Beware, those, that's one that will be forever remembered. Right there with Hill- once in a lifetime. Right there with Hillbilly Jim and Little Beaver. <laughs> <laughs> what? That was a real match. It is a real match. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, they yeah. were a, they were in a, they were in a six man tag. They, they they didn't fight each other. No, they didn't. They, I don't know why you, why that makes a difference, but okay, it does. It makes all the difference in the world. Uh, but that's WrestleMania three, uh, and the, and then the number one on their list is Starcade eighty three. This is what's considered the first major pay per view. Uh, this, you know, the super card, a sold out Greensboro Coliseum, which I gotta imagine holds about 30,000 people or something, maybe, maybe less. Uh, Stand, and it, standing room, probably 30,000. Yeah. Uh, and it was broadcast on closed circuit television. Uh, to me, I would have put WrestleMania 1 here if they're gonna go with the original. You know, major pay per views. I understand the the idea behind it being the first of them, but I think Vince was more global or you know more nationwide at this point than NWA, uh, and I think uh, it's I think WrestleMania one really did what this one was trying to do with the SuperCard, bring in the celebrities, make it a big hoopla thing. Uh, maybe they took some ideas from this and it, you know, maybe it was a, a solid idea, but to me, it's, I would put WrestleMania 1 over Starcade 83. If nothing else, I knew WrestleMania 1, Starcade 83, I didn't know. To this day, I really don't know it, and I'm a, you know, fairly knowledgeable wrestling fan. Well, I, I've, I've watched a few documentaries where they've talked about Starcade 83, or I guess consider Starcade 1, 
Well, actually, I know. I think they had Starcade before that, but I think this was just the first pay per view for Starcade. Um, I get why it's here, and actually, I agree with the article. Um, I think WrestleMania one does not happen if they didn't see how well Starcade '83 actually did. If Starcade '83 tanked and made no money on pay per view sales, I think Vince may have. Not, there may have been a WrestleMania, but probably not in '85. Um, or was it '84? Uh, I, I just, I think he, that might have been maybe a few more years down the road, but because Starcade was such a big success, it was the original Supercard. There was, you know, it was, it was, it really was the groundwork for both the pay per view business and, you know, putting ce- the celebrities in there and trying to make this event appeal to a, a national audience. And I, do agree that I don't, I disagree to have both Starcade 83 and WrestleMania one on here. Cause I think they both serve the same purpose. Right. I uh, give so you that. I understand, Absolutely. Why, I understand Starcade 83. They pick that because they believe that's more of the pioneer pay-per-view that started it all. Haddock, uh, do you want to weigh in on a pay-per-view no, from a federation? I mean, you never I watched was, three years before negative, you were born. I was negative three. And, uh, I have never, uh, seen or read anything about this other than what's here on this on this article so i mean other than the concept of i could see it leading to a wrestlemania and and that concept i definitely see why it's very important uh but other than that i can't really add anything other than reading you that uh you know the assassins defeated rufus r jones and bugsy mcgraw and that just sounds phenomenal in its own right (laughs) hashtag once in a lifetime uh, so that's that's the Starcade list uh, as we kind of wind the podcast down. Real quick, um, we had two that were not listed. One was WrestleMania One was on our list. It was on mine for reasons we just talked about with Starcade. Uh, I won't go any further on that. Other than I want to add in WrestleMania One, Andre the Giant defeated Big John Stud in a body slam challenge for fifteen thousand dollars. Had Andre lost that, he would have been forced to retire. And, uh, you know, WrestleMania 3 would never have happened. So thank God he was able to beat Big John Studd in that body slam challenge. <laughs> uh, the other one on the list was WrestleMania 30. Uh, Haddix, I believe you had this on your list if you want to talk for a second and on it. The, the big thing was the whole Undertaker thing. And maybe that was more kind of to what we were talking about earlier. Maybe that was more of a moment than necessarily a pay-per-view. But... As you're you're as talking as about this is when Undertaker's 21 and 0 and, yeah, the, WrestleMania the streak, streak was ended. To, uh, to the beast Brock Lesnar. He was the one in the 21 yeah. and 1. So, I mean, it, obviously huge moment, especially when it comes to WrestleMania. I mean, people wanted you know Undertaker to retire undefeated at WrestleMania, and he lost here. I mean, so maybe that was more of a moment than an actual Yeah, I would put but, this on the – maybe this may even be number one for most – Biggest moments in WrestleMania history. Like, th- yeah, that's got to yeah. be right there with Andre uh, getting slammed by Hogan, you know, yeah. uh, those kind of things. I still remember the moment in Kaiser's basement watching that and him and I just looking at each other like, the match is over? Just like, completely it was, stunned. It was, like, silent. It was just, we, were, we were both stunned for multiple Wait, minutes. wait, wait, wait. Stone Cold was in that match? <laughs> I was just going to – I was actually going to make a Stone well, Cold was, joke right there. there. He was there to correct uh, Mr. Superdome or Silverdome fucking Hogan. <laughs> so uh yeah so i think at this point you may take it back from the influential list but yeah uh yep. put it on a different list uh anything else uh that you guys any pay-per-views that we have not mentioned before we quickly tell you give our top threes i think uh going back to like some of these some of these pay-per-views where you know they were big because people got over i don't know how 13's not on there where stone cold turned face after not after passing out in the I quit match with Bret Hart with the blood all over his face, uh, I mean I, I think because it, other than that I don't think I don't remember. But I, I mean, feel like it, thirteen wasn't that much memorable other than that. But I mean, that's like that is a huge. I mean, that's Stone Cold Steve. If, if that's a if that's another wrestler, okay. But would I mean, you put that bigger? Would you put that moment or his King of the Ring moment uh, as a bigger bigger moment I, in his I feel his like career? That's, I feel like that they're very close, but that pay per view, he turned face, and I think that kind of led into the whole toughest sob gimmick. That basically was his gimmick, 
going forward. He didn't. Well, tap King out of the King of the Rings out. started his Austin three sixteen, well, and yeah, that's the yeah, bottom yeah, line. So I mean, those promo are promo cut. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, the fact that it's WrestleMania against Bret Hart, and you know, I mean, it was just it was a very big moment, and, and what actually started Stone Cold's career, you know, who knows? But I just feel like that should have been on this list than some of these other ones that were on there. If, if anything, maybe not number one, but at least on here than some other ones. That's fair. Hoagland, anything you want to add? I want to say King of the ring wasn't even on this list. And I personally think, uh, Austin winning King of the ring was more influential to both his career and the business than WrestleMania 13. And I don't think it's even close. Uh, there you have it. That's the bottom line. Cause Kyle Hoagland said so. Seriously. Uh, You're a so, stupid idiot, Haddix. Okay, uh, real quick, guys. Why don't you give me your top three most influential pay-per-views, uh, probably off the the ones we just listed, uh, Haddix? Uh, maybe more biased towards WWE, but I think number three would be I'll have to do the bash, bash at the beach just from what you guys have said and, I mean, just how big NWO was. Uh, number two, I'm going to go with uh, – I'm going to go with Survivor Series 97, the start of the McMahon character, because I think that was huge. And just to spite Hoagie, my number one is WrestleMania 13. Oh, you done Cold fucked Steve up. Steve Austin. Yeah, done fucked up. When Stone Cold Steve Austin didn't quit and he was bleeding. Damn, this this guy bringing his number one from a list of ones that we have not even mentioned. So there well, you go. That, that's that's a stubborn pick. We all know that, this. Boom. That's a, that's a Vince Russo swerve right there. Boom. Damn. Hoagland? How about you? Uh, I will go number three being – I almost want to say Starcade 83 because I totally understand why it's on the list, but I won't. That will be my honorable mention. I will actually put down Halloween Havoc as number three. Um, I know that's a really? weird thing to say, but I do because I think that was the one of the biggest turning points and the reason why WCW – other than uh, other stupid things that they did, but I, other than a list of a laundry list of other poor management <laughs> decisions that WCW's the done, of Doom and all those other things, but I think Halloween Havoc Havoc was definitely the beginning of the like the downward slope of WCW and its eventual, you know, exodus. Uh, so I'll put that at, at number three. Uh, number two, I'll go uh, WrestleMania fourteen. Which I think a lot of people said that that uh, the Austin win, Tyson being in the pay per view, um, it was it was uh, to me like that was the beginning of WWE taking over the Monday Night Wars, and number one, barely legal ninety seven. I don't know how you could even put that on the list and be serious. I, do. I will because I mean, you're going to give me shit for my WrestleMania. 13. Fine, you know, here's, you know what, all right, here, here, barely legal will be number three. I'll say Barely Legal's 90. I forgot about Barely Legal. I still want to put them on there because I think they deserve the credit. Barely Legal number three, Halloween Havoc number two, WrestleMania 14 number one. As far as influential. I was going to say, if you were to put Barely Legal as your number one most influential pay per view of all time from a. The third brand that did not last, I was going to (laughs) laugh you right off of this podcast, sir. Like, I'll, I'll say, I'll have a stubborn pick and that'll be Barely Legal 97 at number three. All right. Uh, my list, WrestleMania 14. Survivor Series 97, Bash at the Beach 96, brother. Uh, because they started the, the Attitude Eras and Monday Night Wars. And I still think Hogan turning heel was the biggest moment in wrestling history. A moment that will never be topped, no matter how hard they try. And that includes Nikki Bella showing up as the third man this, this past dude, weekend. That was whoa, their, whoa, whoa, their whoa, moment. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't don't be throwing things like that out on the podcast, dude. That's not true. All right. That's my that's my bold uh, statement. All right. <laughs> uh, so that's it for us this week. Uh, feel free to reach out to us uh, on Twitter, Facebook, all that stuff. Uh, let us know what your most influential wrestling pay per views of all time are. Tell Hoagie why barely legal should barely make a top ten list, let alone Dang. a top three list. Uh, and, uh, you know, subscribe, leave us some feedback on iTunes. Uh, we've got, you know, we, we always appreciate that stuff. Uh, coming up next week, we're going to, uh, preview the NFL season. We're going to talk a little football. Um, you know, we'll, uh, give our predictions that are always so accurate. Uh, so look forward to that. 
from the home of Taboo Tuesday 2005 to the home of Cyber Sunday 2006 might be two of the most influential pay-per-views. I'll let you be the judge of that. I am Josh Kaiser. He is Josh Haddix, and he is Kyle Hoagland. And we will see you guys next time. Have a good Friday. Facebook, Twitter, pseudonerdpod.com. See ya.